Thanks for uh, coming out, guys. Really appreciate the in-person uh, attendance. Uh, welcome to EMS Challenge, guys, online. We're here in Oxford, the Civic Center. Thank you, Oxford Fire, for bringing us down. Really appreciate it. Um, if you're in the area, we're doing lectures from 9 to 11. Then we got Skill Lab from 1230 to 230-ish. Um, you got myself and Dr. Payne, who is a UAB uh, ER attending, doing an extra year of training in EMS. He's an EMS fellow. We'll be doing advanced airway. We'll be doing uh, surgical airways. I brought some pig traits. We can eat them afterwards. Good. Yeah, good. Somebody laughed. Thank you. You're a fireman. Y'all eat anything. I know you do. Hello. Um, and then we're going to do some mega codes. The uh, fire college is bringing their equipment down. We'll have some of their sim stuff as well. So um, the goal for EMS challenge, we started this several years ago. And the goal for this was to improve uh, Con Ed in the region, um, to bring physician care, physician education back to you guys. Um, when I started in the EMS 30-ish years ago, there seemed to be more docs involved. That's kind of gone by the wayside, in my opinion. Um, my opinion could be wrong, I've been told, but that's okay. Um, but my goal is to bring more docs involved. So in the Brims region, currently we have the two fellows, myself. There's uh, another two faculty that want to do EMS work to help us as well. And then we get a resident, an ER resident out every month. So in the Brims region, you'll see that. Hopefully we can expand that to other regions as we grow our program there. So for your certificate today, if you're online, look in the chat box, there'll be a link you can fill out. In here, you can do the QR code. You can always email us at alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. Try to get those emails in by 2 o'clock today if you want the Con Ed certificate for that. Upcoming events. Um, We'll be at the Fire College in October, the fourth Wednesday of October. Uh, same thing, lectures in Skill Lab. The State EMS Conference is the first week of November. That will be the first SMEC meeting we've had in about a year and a half. It should be interesting. So if you have a desire to help change things, know what's going on in the state, that's a good place to show up, listen, ask questions, and uh, observe. Uh, we'll be in no uh, Orange Beach again in November with the Volunteer Rescue Squad. That'll be a Friday. It'll be at uh, uh, EMS challenge is going to be more geared toward the EMT and advanced EMT level. Uh, we'll be out that way. And we're still at center point on the uh, second Wednesday of each month. So, can y'all see the screen okay? Lights okay up here for you guys? Yes, no? Sweet. So, we'll talk a little bit about ketamine. I still get uh, issues or concerns, questions about ketamine a lot. Uh, ketamine was approved a couple of years ago for us to use for excited delirium or altered mental status. Uh, and also pain control. If you've been watching the news, there are issues out in Colorado right now. There was some new legislature where they changed it where you actually have to get the weight of the patient before you get the ketamine. There's some other things there um, that was due to a bad outcome. Um, I can tell you ketamine in the hospital setting, when you have a patient who is not taking any additional medications or drugs, not intoxicated, not injured, ketamine is really safe to use. Um, but that's not the kind of patients you guys see or I see, right? Uh, the guy that I see that's butt naked dancing at a telephone pole at two in the morning probably has been taking something besides ketamine before I get there, right? Um, so there's some issues with ketamine. We kind of want to talk about it. Um, when should you use it um, for excited delirium? Uh, that's a kind of a made up diagnosis that we use in medicine. And it's basically someone who is altered, agitated, acting bizarrely uh, or acutely psychotic. And we really can't control them safety, safely. Um, it's pretty obvious that physical restraint, fighting with a patient is not good for anyone, for you or for them, or for the attorneys, right? Um, so it's better to sedate them or chillax them uh, chemically. And ketamine is a pretty decent drug to do that for the most part, as long as you understand how it works and the risk to that, okay? So six foot male, acutely psychotic, when approached, he kind of screams and calls at the police. He's diaphoretic. He appears to be responding to internal stimuli. That means he's talking to himself. He's tripping, he's pinging, whatever term you like to use, right? All right. Uh, he has a hi history of similar events in the past. This is the guy that you probably run on two or three times a month, right? So this guy, acutely agitated, ketamine seems reasonable to take, her, take charge of the situation, to get him safely treated to the, at the hospital, and to make sure there's not a bad outcome from this guy, right? All right. This is a six-foot male in a nursing home. Uh, when approached, he kind of screams and claws at the police or at the staff. He's diaphoretic, he's confused, he's got a Foley bag, cloudy urine in it. He occasionally gets confused, similar events in the past. Um, this guy, does he need ketamine? He needs, yes, praise God, thank you, sir. Right, he does not need ketamine, right? This guy is altered, and by our protocols, altered mental status, you could use ketamine. 
but ketamine is not going to help this guy. This guy does not have excited delirium. You give this older person a little bit of ketamine, now you're going to have respiratory problems, other issues, treat the underlying cause, and that's what we do with excited delirium. Cool. Exactly. So how do you dose ketamine? Anybody know? Who learned about ketamine in paramedic school? Anybody? Yeah, nobody. Oh, one person. That's You're in school now. That's not fair. Yes, ma'am. Right. So ketamine has been a drug that's been controlled by the hospitals for years by anesthesia. There's still some hospitals in this state when I go to work extra money to feed my family and pay my bills, right? Um, I can't get ketamine unless I walk down to the pharmacy, smile, sign a form, and then take it back to the ER. Uh, so the fact that we have it in the pre-hospital world is fantastic. We just got to understand how it works and how to use it. Ketamine should be based on ideal body weight. <clears throat> there are very few people in Alabama who have the ideal body weight. Some of you firemen do, right? But that's about it. It's not the patients that I take care of, right? Ideal body weight should be based upon height, in my opinion. There are all kind of formulas out there that you can use, and these make me cross my eyes, all right? Just like that. It's Chuck E. Cheese. Remember, remember Chuck E. Cheese? Yeah, that'll make you want to do ketamine, right? Um, so I kind of think of uh, ideal body weight as height-based, sort of like the brass tape, but for adults. So I use 52 kilograms at five foot and two kilograms per inch for males, or 50 and five foot and two for females. That means you got to do some math. So there are a couple of ways to do this. One, I recommend figure out what the dose of ketamine that you would take would be. So you know your height, figure out your dose if you were butt naked dancing on a telephone pole, right? That way, when you look at your patient, you can compare your height to their height and get a rough estimate of what you need, okay? So example, five foot six inch male, weighs 350 pounds, so he's about 160 kilos. If I gave him four migs per kilo of ketamine, which our protocol says we can, I just gave him 640 milligrams of ketamine. That's more than one vial. That's a big freaking dose of ketamine. If he was being sedated for a procedure, he may do fine with that but he's probably got drugs on board. You get this guy 640 of ketamine, I'll bet you the $13 in my wallet right now, that within the next 15 minutes, he'll be apneic and you can have a bad event. That. His ideal body weight is 64 kilograms. That's 250-ish milligrams, so it's a big freaking difference in dosing there. So you can see it's pretty important to understand ideal body weight. There are a lot of drugs that we should use ideal body weight on. The most important one that you guys carry is ketamine, okay? You can be gender neutral, and just do 50 kilograms by foot and two inch per kilogram, that's fine. The other option I'd say is that if you don't understand ideal body weight, if you can't calculate that at two o'clock in the morning when you're on your second 24 hour shift, no worries, we all get tired. Calculate your four migs per kilo on regular body weight, cut the dose in half and go that route, okay? I'm just saying these things to keep you out of trouble, keep your patients out of trouble, and so you don't end up on the news as well. The most important thing with ketamine is post-ketamine administration, if you give somebody ketamine, once they chillax and you're able to safely assess them and work with them, they are now a critical patient. So you got the guy that's butt naked that the cops are helping you with. You give ketamine, five, ten minutes later now he's chillaxed, he's relaxing. You roll him over, you cut his clothes off, you expose him, you look for reasons for him to be excited. Maybe he's got patches on, maybe he's got drug patches, maybe he's got injuries. You check a glucose, you put him on the monitor. Cardiac monitor, SAT monitor, blood pressure monitor. If you have entitled CO2, the nasal cannula, anybody have that here? Oh, sweet, y'all have money in this town. I like that. That's good. Those things are expensive. Yeah, put him on that as well. This guy gets one. He is now critical, okay? This is not your, he may be your frequent flyer, but he's critical because people can die post-ketamine, and that's not what we want to do in healthcare, right? So you expose him, AccuCheck, put him on the monitor. More importantly, if he desats, now this guy is setting 80%. You don't put him on oxygen, and that goes against all the theory that we learned in the past. If he's hypoxic post-ketamine, it's not because he has something in his lungs making him hypoxic. He's hypoxic because he's not breathing, right? So you already got his clothes cut off. He's exposed. You're looking at him. He's hypoxic, jaw thrust. That fixes the problem. High five your partner. Put him on the stretcher. Move to the hospital. If that doesn't work after a jaw thrust, put a nasal trumpet in him or put an OPA in him. If that doesn't work, and you're going to have to give him oxygen, you bag him. You ventilate him as well. So oxygen goes on this patient when you start to ventilate them. Okay? These folks get hypoxic because they're not breathing well. You'll go to blogs on the internet. you hear other people talk about ketamine does not make you quit breathing. True, if that's all you ever took. Again, most of our patients are doing more than one drug. You add ketamine, they will quit breathing. You just put oxygen on them, 
they're going to go into cardiac arrest because they're not breathing in the next 8, 10, 12 minutes. And the other point I'll say is if somebody gets ketamine, they don't go with the police. They go to the hospital. There's no way you give someone ketamine and they go to the jail because you'll be on the news the next day. And more importantly, you probably just help kill somebody. All right, thanks for smiling. Good. I got a depressed crowd now. Good. The goal is to get them chillaxed enough so they can call you mama names and you take them to the hospital. The goal is not to realize they're hypoxic 10 minutes later, put them on your Lucas, and then bury them. Okay? Thank you for smiling. All right. Let's talk about 12 leads. So 12 leads are really not that complicated. They're a great screen tool. People try to make these way too complicated. You learn about vectors and angles and all that stuff. And to be honest with you, I got to review that every couple of years to make sure I understand it. But if this is more of a screen tool, these 12 leads, then I keep it simple. I look at a 12 lead and I look at, is it too fast? Is it too slow? Or is it okay-ish, right? Because I'm, I'm worried about taking care of the patient in front of me, right? Not the academics of it. So if it's too fast, American Heart, I like. Is it wide or narrow, regular or irregular? I love their algorithm. I agree 100% with them. For too slow, there are three things that I think about. So obviously, get bradycardic. Um, for example, if I got a six-year-old kid who is set in 80% and their heart rate goes down to 50, what's their problem? Hypoxemia, right? You figure that out in your primary exam. You should recognize they're not breathing at that point, and you're going to fix that. You got a dude shot in the belly with a heart rate of 140, cussing you, and route to the hospital. Now he's 120, 110, 90, 70. What's going on with him? Yeah, he's hypovolemic. He's bleeding out. So you can pick those things up on your exam. Things you don't pick up, in my opinion, are three things. Drugs, electrolytes, and ischemia. So by drugs, everybody in Alabama, not everybody, 80% of people in Alabama are on blood pressure medicines. Calcium channel blockers, beta blockers. These folks are older. If they're on those medications, they already have underlying health problems. If they get dehydrated, they accidentally take too much of those things, they'll get bradycardic. And you're not going to figure that out without asking questions and thinking about it. You're not going to pick it up on your exam. Electrolytes. How many people do y'all know or have y'all transported that have kidney problems? Raise your hand if you've ever seen a patient with a kidney problem. If you have not, raise your hand. Exactly. Good. Yeah. So a lot of uh, uh, kidney failure, dialysis patients, hyperkalemia makes you slow and wide. You got to think about it. If you don't think about it, you're going to miss it. Somebody dies. And then ischemia. <clears throat> and that's uh, you know, a STEMI or an NSTEMI heart attack. And these last two you can pick up on EKG. You can determine if they're having a heart attack or STEMI. And you can see if they're hyperkalemic on a 12 lead. Those things we can pick up now. And then the scariest EKGs are the ones that are okay-ish. They're not too fast, they're not too slow, but you look at your patient and they look like dirt. And you gotta figure out, can the EKG tell me what's going on with them or not? And those are things we can kind of figure out now. You gotta understand the basics, calculate a rate. Don't just look at your monitor, all right? I also say when you calculate a rate, put your hand on the patient's wrist or the carotid or the groin. And that would tell you, is it regular or irregular? Is it strong? Is their skin cool? Is it warm or the diaphoretic? A lot of freaking data. Don't spend 10 minutes looking at this EKG without touching the patient and talking to them too. I use the box method. So if I am looking at the paper, I say 300, 150, 100. At that point, I don't really care. And this, I stare a little bit longer and I get down to about the eighth box and then they're way too slow, right? I use 50 to 100 being the normal, uh, the rate that I like. Intervals, you got to understand. PR interval, QRS, QRS, you got to know that if it's wide or narrow for AHA for your tachycardias. QT interval is very important in people that pass out and get into sorsades. There are also medicines you guys carry that prolong that QT and can hurt somebody. PR interval, um, what is something the PR interval can, can tell you? This heart block, so first degree heart block, long PR, first degree heart block. Most people with a first degree heart block don't have any bad outcomes. We kind of say, yeah, you got a heart block. Let's watch it. In 20 years, you may have some issues. What else does a long PR tell you that's more important? Anybody know? Anybody care? <laughs> that's the trick. Yeah, thank you. I got three smiles. Good. So a long PR interval makes me think hyperkalemia. If I got a long PR interval and my QRS starts getting wide, I'm thinking hyperkalemia. So then I'm looking at the patient. Do they have a history of kidney problems? They got a big dialysis graft? Oh, well, crap, they're hyperkalemia to prove and otherwise, and I start treatment at that point in the game. So EKGs can give you a lot of information, and there's not a lot of risk to it. So I look at this one, I say, is it too fast, is it too slow, or is it okay-ish? I say the rate's okay-ish, all right? So if I start doing my box method, I got 300, 150, 175-ish, machine says 73, who cares, right? It's close enough. So rate's okay, 
The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at injury patterns. I'm going to press a button to see if there's a laser in them. I jack it up. So I look at leads one, leads ABL, and five and six. Those are my lateral leads. I'm looking for ST elevation. If that looks fine, I go to two, three, and ABF. Those are inferior leads, the lower part of the heart. Then I look V1 through V4. V1 and 2 are my septal. 3 and 4 are my anterior leads. So first place I look is lateral, 1, AVL, and 5 and 6. Then I'm looking inferior. I'm looking for ST elevation. Those are STEMIs. If I got two leads like that, I'm done. Diagnosis made. They're having a STEMI. I go down that treatment path. I'm moving toward the hospital, right? That's just like a trauma. It's time sensitive. And there are things in the hospital we can do that you can't do, right? After inferior, I'm going septal or anterior for elevation. You can also look in V2, 3, and 4 for depression. So T wave inversion and ST depression, that's a posterior heart attack, posterior STEMI, until proven otherwise. If you go to some of these blogs, uh, Life in the Fast Lane, some of the, uh, the uh, EMS blogs, they talk about if you see this, you can do a posterior EKG. Have y'all heard of that? Doing it backside of the EKG. Those are really cool to do, but I don't do them because I don't need them. And I don't think you do either. If you have this, that's enough information to say they're having a STEMI, then you see a cardiologist, right? So if I did this and I did a posterior EKG and it looks fine, I still don't care. That's enough right there that makes me uncomfortable. I'm on the phone with the cardiologist before I go into a cath lab, okay? The other thing is in the pre-hospital world and the ER, I don't have time for this because I'd bet you 20 bucks, you got two more calls waiting, right? So you're not going to do extra things that don't really help the patient. So that's enough to say, last of STEMI, all right, move on down the road. The last place I look is lead AVR. In 2013, American Heart said that if you have elevation and lead AVR and depression anywhere else, one ABL, five and six, two, three or AVF or any of these, that that is a STEMI equivalent. By that, I mean they could be having a big heart attack. All right, if they're having one here, it's really bad because this is where the left main comes off the aortic arch. And if you're up here and down somewhere else and that gets worse, the whole heart's going to die. The patient's going to basically go into cardiac arrest. Questions, comments, statements within reason? Not within reason. Good. All right. Any unreasonable questions? No. All right. This is a schematic that uh, kind of shows where everything is. So the left side of the heart, circumflex. Most people are left dominant. Right side of the heart, inferior leads is right coronary, and this is the aorta where both of the main vessels of the heart come off of it. Left main, you can kind of see how that works. So it's really important, I say this most of the time on the classes I do, that you guys understand how to read a 12 lead as a medic. When paramedicine was started in the 70s, late 70s, and we got really busy in the 80s and 90s, we learned a lot about three lead interpretation, junctional rhythms, heart blocks, VTAC, VFib, and we still got to know that stuff. We didn't learn about 12 leads because back then there was nothing we could do. I could look at a 12 lead in the late 80s and say, yep, you're having a heart attack. I'm going to hang a lot of cane drip so you don't go into VTAC. I'm going to give you an aspirin, going to give you a hug, tell you to sit around, don't do anything, hope you have a good day, hope you survive. Now we have heart casts. Now we have thrombolytics. We can actually take somebody having a freaking left main heart attack coming in, fix that, and then go back to work and do physical activity a few weeks later. So it's important that you as the medics know how to read a 12 lead. Now you don't have to be super fancy, okay? The things is the ER doc, the cardiologist talks about it, like I really don't care. I say STEMI or no STEMI, right? Um, and that's what I kind of expect from the medics as well, because you should be able to read that. We trust our machines, but we shouldn't trust our machines to read them. The machine's about 70, 80% correct. Anybody see this? What's wrong with that? picture right there. Yeah, how do you get a 79 over 80? Yeah, I got to think about that one for a second. I'm not sure that's happening, right? So my point to that is the machines do good with some things, but not everything. The machine reads a great rate. It can calculate your intervals sometimes, but it, if it doesn't say STEMI, you can still have a STEMI. If it says STEMI, you cannot be having a STEMI. So if you want to do the best for your patient, learn how to read 12 leads. All right, cool. So first case. 54-year-old diabetic male complains of some nausea and kind of weird feeling after smoking some weed and watching Hamilton. You ever watch Hamilton? That is weird. There you go. Be brave. Yes, sir. Be brave. Yes, sir. Yeah. We'll sing later. Okay. Okay. <laughs> weird show, but I like it. Um, 
so first responders say you got a blood pressure 180 over 60, respirations of 14, heart rate 70, set and fine. If you're starting to line with somebody, you're getting a glucose. It gives you a lot of information. It says low, you can fix it. If it says high, they're probably a diabetic and they're probably either in DKA or hyperosmolar. You know how to fix that, all right? If it says anything in between, welcome to Alabama, right? Everybody's got a glucose a little bit high. And the dude's diaphoretic as well. So what do you want to do for this guy? So you walk on scene, first responders call out his vital signs. You got an older, well, a young diabetic that's diaphoretic. What do y'all think about could be going on with this dude? Nobody cares. He's been smoking weed, so you just kind of blow him off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, was the mic on for that, sir? Good, good. I hope we got that broadcast. Yes, yes. Roll Tide. <laughs> All right, next slide. And so our protocols talk about there's a chest pain algorithm, but it's really a suspected acute coronary syndrome. So the classical picture for a heart attack is somebody says, oh, I'm having chest pain, I'm short of breath, and I'm sweaty. The chest pain's on my left side of my chest, it's going down my arm. That's the classic. And to be called classical in medicine, you've got to be about 25% of the people that present with that. So that means that if 25% of the people come, present with chest pain going down the left arm and saying they're having a heart attack, the other 75% present other ways, right? So I got an old diabetic that feels weird with or without pot. He gets a 12 lead. High risk for having cardiac disease. If he's short of breath, if he's nauseous, he's a diaphoretic, it makes me uncomfortable. Remember diabetes, diabetics have poor circulation, they have uh, issues with nerves, so sometimes they don't feel their pain, right? So it makes me uncomfortable. So he's gonna get a 12 here in a few minutes. So that's the first thing my mind goes to is, okay, diabetic, nauseous, feeling weird, I'm gonna get set up for a 12 lead. <clears throat> we teach the residents, we teach them to do a history Take a history from a patient, wash their hands, do a physical, wash their hands, and then figure out what they're going to do. You guys and I don't have that luxury. So we do our history, our physical, and our treatment all at the same time. So my hands are on this patient. He's been put on the monitor, and I'm asking questions, right? I'm doing my ABCs and asking questions. And the questions I ask should be geared toward determining if I think this guy is sick or not sick. I'm not just checking out boxes, right? So I'm asking pertinent questions. I don't care if he's on vitamin or vitamin C, and he takes extra supplements, and he runs four times a day, all that does not matter. The things I'm thinking about is one, hey sir, are you a diabetic? Confirm that he is. Ever had a heart attack or a stroke? If they said yes, you know he's got bad vascular disease already, and now my brain is like, okay, I'm gonna move a little bit faster and get my 12 lead and start thinking about what I'm gonna do for this guy, okay? So you ask questions that are important, you're risk stratifying them, are they sick or not sick? That's what your questions are for, all right? So we got vitals, he's a little bit distressed. And this is his 12 lead. So too fast, too slow, or okay-ish. I say it's okay-ish, all right? So the rate says 67, but I'm not looking at that. I'm looking down here, I'm counting my boxes, 300, 150, 170-ish. My hand's on his wrist, it's regular, it's bounding, but he's sweaty. All right, so rate's okay. So the next thing I'm gonna start doing is looking at injury patterns because I don't wanna miss a semi. I look at leads one, AVL, and five and six. I go back, I look at two, three, and AVF. I'm looking at V1 through V4, and I go back and look at AVR. And one thing I didn't mention earlier is after I do this, I go back and look at intervals, right? So I'm looking at my PR interval, my QRS interval, right? My QT interval. And before I put the EKG down, I look one more time to make sure I'm not missing a STEMI because there's some days I've been up way too late and worked way too long and I get tired, right? So I'm gonna double check this. So what do y'all think about this EKG? What do y'all see, anything concerning? Thank you for laughing, praise God, somebody's laughing, right? Yes, if you miss this, it's time to go back and do something else for a living, right? I think my kids could pick this one up. That looks very concerning. I don't even have to go through my algorithm. My, my eyes go to it and my brain is using profanity, right? My brain is cussing right now, right? And I'm also thinking no wall time though. <laughs> so, right? So, one AVL and lateral, big freaking ST elevation. So, this is already a STEMI. For me, I still go through and look at everything to make sure that I'm always doing the same way every time so that when I'm tired, I don't miss something. But I'm already like, um, hey, dude, just get him set up to go. Somebody put him in the trauma in the STEMI system, which is coming statewide. Right? I'm looking there, I'm looking here, AVR, 
this is a freaking STEMI, right? So now everything changes. So now I don't care if he told me he never had a heart attack or have heart disease. I don't care if he was, was or was not a diabetic, right? So now my questions go from risk stratifying to see if he has heart disease to I know he's got heart disease. Now my questions change. And I start asking questions that matter as far as treatment. So now I got this 54 year old dude smoking some weed, feeling weird at his house. <clears throat> I'm gonna think about treatment and appropriate questions. Oh. There's a funny slide. Look at that. That's cute. The golden skin. All right. Thank you for smiling. All right. So, um, here's my. So now I got to start thinking about how I'm going to manage this guy. So how do we treat STEMI? So what are we going to do for this guy? There's all kind of mnemonics out there. There's Mona. There's Fona. There's Kona. All kind of things. So what are we going to do for this guy? So we just got the 12 lead. We got IV access on him. He's sitting there sweating, saying, "I feel weird, man." What are we going to do for him now? Treatment wise. I heard somebody say aspirin. Yeah, so aspirin is great. So aspirin is the A of Mona, Fona, and Kona, right? What does aspirin do? What's the benefit of aspirin? Besides making somebody at bear rich, right? Yeah, so aspirin jacks up platelets. Platelets help clot blood. If he's got a clot in his vessel, so if this is the blood supply going to his heart, there's a clot there that's making him have that STEMI. The body's response to this is say, hey, there's a clot. Everybody down here is hypoxic. This send more blood cells there to fix this. More blood cells show up and they screw it up, right? It's like American. When well, I can't say that. Um, so the plate that's get there, they get stuck together and they get bigger. You give aspirin, plate that's can't stick together. They float downstream. So aspirin is very important, right? Um, what are the contraindications to aspirin? People you don't give aspirin to. Right. So active bleeding is one contraindication in the protocols. What else? What? Allergy. Allergy. Yeah. Sir? And someone who's already had it. Yeah, so those are three things I think about uh, contraindications, right? So if dude's having chest pain and I don't look at the 12 lead yet, and he says, yeah, I also have ulcers and I crap blood often, I'm not going to give him aspirin. There's a risk for making him bleed, right? Once I see he's had a 12 lead that says STEMI, risk to benefit, he gets the aspirin. I don't care if he's got a GI bleed or not because we got to get this better or make this not worse, right? And if he starts crapping blood in the hospital, we can give him blood products and fix that. So at that point, it changes. So if he's having chest pain and not having a STEMI, no aspirin for him. If he's having a STEMI, he gets aspirin. The only person that would not get aspirin is if they say, yeah, that's time I took aspirin. The doc had to put a tube in my neck. They had to cut me. I swelled up. He gets no aspirin. Everybody else gets aspirin. What if he said, man, I took two aspirin just before you got here. What do you say? So y'all are nice. I say, good, here's your full aspirin. Because I've had people take aspirin at home and you look at the bottle and it's Tylenol or it's Motrin or it's Percocet or it's meth, right? So lots of things that can be. The point is limited risk for extra aspirin, but there's a bad risk if you don't give them enough, okay? If the patient's trustworthy and you can look at the aspirin, that's, that's reasonable, but that's not the typical patient population that I see, just saying. All right, what else do they get? Nitro, what's nitro do? Yeah, it makes this vessel get bigger so better blood flow downstream, right? What are the uh, contraindications or risk to nitro? What people do you give it to? Adequate blood pressure. Yeah, so if dude's sitting there with the blood pressure of 80 and you pop a nitro on him, what did you do? You started a code. Now you're busy, right? Not good, right? So blood pressure, what else do you not want to give him nitro to? So there's a lot of talk about that, inferior STEMI. So when you have an inferior STEMI, you think right-sided from that diagram I showed you. And if the right side of heart is bad, you can get a big drop in blood pressure. I would argue if he's having an inferior STEMI, he's hurting, you see the STEMI on the EKG, and his blood pressure is 140 over 90, he still gets nitro, right? The thing is, before you give nitro to somebody, put an IV in them. So if you do drop the blood pressure, you can fix it with fluids. So... Um, I would say heart rate is another problem. They're bradycardic. They're probably having a right-sided. They probably are having right ventricular involvement. You don't want to do nitro. If the heart rate's 160, I'm not popping a nitro. I'm thinking something is weird here. I got to control that rate first because it's too fast. And then what's another reason not to give somebody nitro? Yeah. You got a 54-year-old dude hanging out, smoking some weed. Maybe he took something else that night, right? So Viagra, Cialis. And you can't ask these people this question, sir, did you take any Viagra? And there'd be a crowd of people around. What's he going to say? Nope. Not today, liberal, right? That's what he's going to say to you. So you got to be respectful, 
but build that rapport, bend down and whisper, hey dude, you take anything to help you out tonight? If so, I need to know it because I'm gonna give you a medicine that can kill you if you did. If you did, that's fine, okay? Say so we all take it, no worries. Just let me know, right? Thank you for smiling, good, tough crowd. So we got aspirin and nitro, what is the O? Oxygen, right. So what does American Heart say about oxygen? Yeah, American Heart says give it they're hypoxic or have complaints of dyspnea, right? I agree. Supplemental oxygen is uh, only warranted if they're hypoxic or complaints of shortness of breath. I would argue that giving someone having a STEMI oxygen is pre-oxygenation before they go into cardiac arrest. So these folks, I throw them on a couple of liters of nasal cannula that regard this. That way, if I'm taken to the hospital and it's me in the back of the truck and all of a sudden they go into cardiac arrest, I can just crank that O2 up, start CPR and do what I got to do. So we won't get into a lot of that. I still think oxygen is reasonable for STEMI patients regardless of hypoxia or dyspnea, but I'd bet you my $13 again, if you ask them if they're short of breath, they're gonna say yes, right? Cool. And what is the M? Morphine, what's morphine do? Relaxes them, yeah, they chillax, man, they get high. So he's already had a little weed, now he gets a little morphine, great American weekend, right? So morphine is good. What is the F for Fona? Anybody know? Fentanyl, y'all carry fentanyl? Yeah, so fentanyl is semi-reasonable. Fentanyl doesn't lower blood pressure, but it will get you a little bit high. It might even make them feel better. Fentanyl's okay. There's some data that morphine jacks up some of the medicines we give in the cath ab. I'm not convinced. Fentanyl doesn't, but morphine or fentanyl is reasonable. What is K? Ketamine. Is ketamine a good drug to give somebody having a heart attack? Probably not. What does ketamine do to heart rate? Increases heart rate a little bit, increases blood pressure, right? I would probably not give ketamine to anybody having a STEMI. Not a good idea, some folks do, but I say I would not do it. Cool. So this guy, you've got IV access, he gets his aspirin, he gets his nitro, you give fluids, you call a hospital, you send them a picture of the EKG, they actually trust us for a change, they call cardiology, you get to the hospital. We got a couple of things we can do. So we can give him a clot buster, TPA or TNK. TPA is the same drug we give for strokes, all right? And basically what that does is it takes that clot that's there and it breaks it up and it all floats downstream, all right? So if the clot is fairly fresh and not too complicated, we can open that up and resolve the problem, all right? The state says that we have this checklist in the back of our protocol. I know you all fill them out every patient that has a STEMI. I know y'all have seen these, all right? Um, my statement is, even if you don't fill them out, know these questions, these things are important. So if a guy's had recent back surgery or is having an active GI bleed or ever had an aneurysm in the brain and is having a STEMI, but I can't give him his TPA because I don't want this guy to bleed in his head or completely lose all clotting factors for a while because he'll die from that too. This guy has to go to the cath ab instead, right? So we can go cath ab or we can do thrombolytics, but you need to get this information for us so that if, as you roll in the hospital, guy goes into V-fib arrest and we start CPR, intubate him, shock him once, he doesn't get better, I can maybe give him this, open that clot up and we can salvage the guy. And if you don't tell me he had an aneurysm and I give him TPA, basically I did nothing but made him worse-ish, if you can get worse than dead, right? The point is, understand the contraindications of TPA so you can pass that on to the doc when you get to the hospital, all right? But catheter, cath ab, or TPA, American Heart says you got 30 minutes to give them TPA if you're going to do it. You got 90 minutes to get them to a cath ab. Even if I give them TPA, they're going to go to the cath ab in a couple of hours anyway. It just buys you time. They probably still need stents and other issues. This is just my inappropriate humor about oxygen. There's good data that oxygen, long term, 24, 36 hours is bad for people. It makes free radicals. I'm not going to go into details with that. I gotta Google it half the time anyway, but there's no data that oxygen in the short term hurts anyone. And I think in the environment that you work and I work, I really have them a little bit of supplemental, so if, or excuse me, pre-oxygenation. So if they go into cardiac arrest, we already got passive O2, we can do things for that. People die from heart attacks early on from two things, VTAC, V-fib, or complete heart block, heart failure. So this is a big STEMI here, the medics were great job, got his aspirin, put him on some supplemental O2, put him in the system, en route to the hospital. Guy goes into this, he got one shock of 200 joules, and we got a pulse back. 
Dude's now cussing them again. So it was a quick defib. All right. Didn't have to get intubated, no CPR. So it's a great outcome. But this worked out well because they had already put the dude on pads. So I don't put every patient that has chest pain on defib pads. You'll go broke. If they're having a STEMI, they get pads. That way, if they go into V-fib, all you got to do is put your cigarette out, charge the 200, and zap them once. And you may get lucky and get them back, right? Cool. Nobody smokes here. Right? You spit your dip out. That's what you do, right? That's what I do. Sweet. So, cool. So this is that guy's EKG that we saw a few minutes ago, the, the diabetic guy. So you see he's up and one. AVL and lateral, okay, he's also up V1 through V4, so he's got a high lateral, so he's probably got an infarct coming off of here, because all these leads are elevated and the lateral leads, so a guy has a big risk for having a bad outcome. This is his cath, so he got aspirin, he got other blood thinners in the hospital, he goes to the cath app, they put a wire in his groin, squirt some dime there, and they look at the vessels in the heart. And you can see that this vessel right here is occluded. That's the proximal left anterior descending LAD. So nothing coming out. So they go in and put a stent in it. And now you can see how much of the heart was not getting blood supply. Time is muscle. It sounds corny, but it's true, right? You don't want your heart to be without blood supply for a long time. Older people who have heart disease do better with this because they probably have made extra little vessels that can help feed off these accessory vessels here. Younger folks that have these occlude, acute occlusions don't do as well because that's just a spontaneous clot that kind of formed or a plaque that ruptured. Right? This dude here, sorry, they're calling about my car warranty, I think. Uh, this thing here, see here, is called an impella device. So what that is, is post-cardiac arrest, this muscle, the whole left side of the heart is kind of weak and stunned. It's sort of like if you sleep on your arm all night and you get up in the morning, you can't use your arm. It takes a few minutes for it to start working again, right? You can't do a lot of things. You're not going to go to the gym and pump iron after that. Same thing, except the heart's got to pump, right? There's no choice. So the heart is weak, so they put this impella device in there. It's like a balloon pump. And what the impella does is they run it through, it comes through the aortic arch into the left side of the heart, and it basically sucks blood out of the ventricle and squirts it this way. So it's an extra little pump so that you can refuse the brain, the kidneys, and then obviously it sucks blood out of here, up in the aorta. When this valve closes, the blood flows back down and it feeds the uh, uh, aortic vessels so the heart gets better nutrition. So it's an impeller device and it buys them times. There are balloon pumps out there as well that basically help pump the blood back into the heart, into the vessels, and out to the body. There's artificial pumps that we can, we can run a wire through as well to help them, um, but that's just something we do sometimes post heart attack, post STEMI, uh, to make things better. Second case, this is an older fella in a nursing home. They're all called Legacy or Haven or Good Heaven or something. What's the nursing home around here? Diverse Care. Oh, I like that. Good. They all got cool names, right? Yes, it is diverse. So this is an older dude at a nursing home. I know y'all make these calls. Supposedly he fell and got a big old head laceration. He's sitting there. He's not too happy with the world. So we approach the guy. We get our ABCs, you know, hands on the patient. I'm going to start asking pertinent questions to risk stratify. Is this bad? My questions will be like, hey, dude, did you pass out? Did you get dizzy? Were you having chest pain? Did you trip? Did somebody hit you? Were you trying to commit suicide? You know, risk stratify the guy, right? Right? So you get your vitals, heart rate's fine, blood pressure's decent, respirations are good. He's neuro intact. The nursing home says he falls all the time, okay? He's uh, had a recent GI bug, been having a lot of diarrhea and some vomiting. Uh, they say he's on medicines, but we don't know what they are. We don't really have a list. Right. So I know that never happens in real life. So in my mind, I'm going to start saying, have you ever had a stroke or a heart attack? And he says, yes, I assume he's on a blood thinner. Right. If he's a diabetic, I'm checking an Aki check, et cetera. So I'm going to risk stratify this guy. And obviously, old guy that falls, I'm going to get a 12 lead because he could have just passed out. I don't trust the history with those folks. So this one rate too fast, too slow or OK ish. 
I said the rate's okay. So 300, 150, 100, so maybe a little fast. Even with my glasses on, I'm still pretty comfortable. My hands on this wrist, it's regular. I'm looking at injury patterns, one AVL and five and six, looks good. Two, three and AVF, looks reasonable. V1 through V4, fine. And AVR, looks good. Now I'm gonna go back and look at intervals. My PR interval is there. There's my QT interval. My QRS looks reasonable. And before I lay this back down, I'm gonna look one more time for injury patterns to make sure I'm not missing a STEMI because there's some days I'm really, really tired. So what do I think about this EKG? Anything concerning? Obviously there is, otherwise I put, don't put it up there, right? But I'm gonna put a normal EKG up there. So what's concerning about this one? Oh yeah, good eyesight. The guy in the front can see him. That's why y'all should have moved up, right? Yeah, the QT is freaking long, man. So I can't even count those boxes. The QT should be less than half the R to R. So this dude, this dude right? Uh, half of that way should be the QT. And his QT is almost touching his P, all right? So long QT. So what can a long Q2 interval make people go into? What can they have? Anybody know? Torsades, yeah, so long QT will make you have torsades. If you have torsades, <clears throat> You get poor perfusion to the brain because it's basically VTAC for a few minutes, right? So you pass out, you syncopize, right? What do you call it if you have torsades and you pass out and you don't come out of torsades? What is it called? Dead. Very good. Yes, good. Keep things simple. Good. Yeah. So we kind of went through our algorithm on that uh, previous EKG. QT is way too long. Yeah. So this guy got to the hospital. Uh, the medic was talking to me. He said, hey, doc, what are you making this EKG? This happened while we were waiting. Uh, to get it in the, get off the wall. And I said, what I'll make of that EKG? I make of a admission to cardiology is what I make that of, right? I said, get off the wall, right? So dude was having runs of torsades and then coming out of it. So he got lucky, right? So if you had not recognized the long QT, hopefully you recognize this. But again, I always think about a 12 It gives you a lot of information and there's no risk. You're not going to hurt the patient. A lot of medicines we give out there prolong the QT, Benadryl, all these GI drugs, any psych medication prolongs the QT, obviously cardiac medications. This guy was on Sotolol for heart problems, prolongs the QT. What's a drug you guys give probably every day in EMS that prolongs the QT? Anybody know? Zofran, yeah. So I'm not saying get a 12 lead on every person before you give them Zofran, all right? But I say, if you got a person that is on cardiac medicines, on psych medicines, they're nauseous, and you're going to give them Zofran, I would get a quick 12 lead and look at the QT. If it's more than half the R to R, don't give it to them, okay? If you give it to them, you may have torsades. You get a cool patient. Then you get magnesium, you shock them, do things like that, but you feel bad about it. Trust me. <laughs> the treatment for torsades is magnesium. It's two grams, given pretty quick, all right? The only risk to magnesium is lowering the blood pressure. And that's a relative risk. I really don't see it unless you're giving somebody six or eight grams. Two grams doesn't mess with people too much. But torsades is preventable. So medications help prolong QT, we talked about. Other things that can do it is folks who are malnourished, folks who have diarrhea, you lose magnesium, and a low mag makes you have long QT. So psych patients, cardiac patients, alcoholics who are altered confused, or people who have GI bleeds, or high risk for having a long QT. This is a guy uh, that was uh, in one of our uh, psych rooms that uh, wanted a turkey sandwich. So I gave him a turkey sandwich, right? He really had no other complaints. He needed a place to stay, wanted a turkey sandwich. He told the resident he was nauseous. So they gave him a little bit of Zofran. And I was back in another room and the nurse comes, hey, guy in 14 is coding. I'm like, guy in 14, I just gave a turkey sandwich to you. What are you talking about? So I come out, sure enough, he was, right? So this was a psych patient on a lot of antipsychotic medications, got a little bit of Zofran, and you can kind of see he got the ride to light, right? He got electricity, he didn't syncopize, he died, right? He got electricity, he got magnesium, he did fine. He got his emission, he did fine, right? Uh, but just food for thought, no pun intended. This is an older female, uh, was playing in the yard with her kids, and when she passed out, Family said that she was blue. They did CPR. They called 911. You guys get there, or the, the crew gets there, and she's sitting upright, like, why are y'all here? What happened? I don't need nobody. So what's your first thought? My first thought is BS, right? She did not go into cardiac arrest and get CPR. 
but sometimes we'll be tricked, right? So I'm gonna get ABCs, I'm gonna get a good history in this person, I got my vital signs, pertinent questions or risk stratify her, we talked about it. And then I'm gonna ask them, this ever happened before, all right? And she says, yeah, a lot of times when I exercise, I feel like I'm gonna pass out or I do pass out, right? So I'm checking my pulses, pulses and I put on here heart sounds, all right? I don't listen to heart sounds to everybody because it really doesn't matter. There's only three patients that I listen to heart sounds for that really make a big difference regardless, right? One thing I do on these folks, though, is always get a 12 lead, right? So you're looking for bad EKGs, dysrhythmia, STEMIs, things like that. Her EKG was actually fine, but I heard a big freaking murmur on this lady. So what she's got is she's got aortic stenosis. This is caused by chronic hypertension or congenital problems. And what happens is this valve gets thicker and thicker and doesn't work well. So when she does something that gets her excited, even if she increases her heart rate, she cannot increase blood supply, so she passes out. The problem is she'll continue to pass out to the point where she passes out and she dies. All right. So I'll listen to murmurs for on three types of patients. All right. Uh, and the three types of patients I think about is I think about syncope, people that pass out, I listen to the heart. If they got a big freaking murmur, they have aortic stenosis in my mind to prove otherwise. Okay. The other type of patient I listen to is if they have fever, they have a rash on their hands, I listen to their heart. I think about endocarditis, very important. And the third person I listen to is I have somebody that has an STEMI and they're unstable, I listen to the heart. If they have a murmur, they've probably ruptured a valve, and now what they need is not just a cardiologist, but a cardiothoracic surgeon. All right, cool. Kids can get something similar, it's called hokum. This is the guy on the news that you see, the teenage kid playing basketball or soccer that falls out and dies, okay? It's hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. The left side of the heart gets really thick, cannot pump blood, Eventually, they do exercise, do something that stresses them, and they pass out because they can't increase the cardiac output. The goal for us in the ER and the pre-hospital world is recognize it, okay? So, y'all can stop listening to heart sounds except for three types of patients now. Y'all feel better? I just cut your workload in half, right? Who actually listens to heart sounds anyway? Don't raise your hand, please. Thank you for smiling. These are Tennessee goats. They're so cute. Y'all have goats down here? All right. All right, uh, this one, too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? Irregular, right, right. That's the first thing that pops out of my mind too. Okay, it's irregular, right? So I'm gonna look and I count the rate and it's really hard to count the rate because it's irregular. So I say that looking at this strip, the rate's probably 80-ish, but I'm gonna put my hand on the pulse and see what I got, make sure it's strong. I'm cycling the blood pressure, and I'm looking at the monitor to make sure I don't have any runs of heart rates in the 30s or 40s or the 160s, right? So I'm gonna start looking at injury patterns, one, AVL, lateral, two, three, and AVF, V1 through V4, AVR. I'm gonna try to look for intervals, and it's really jacked up intervals. So I got a P wave there, maybe something there. Who knows, right? QRS is a little bit wide, QT, really don't see much of a T as well. So this is abnormal, right? So let's say this patient has, um, I guess this, the, the question on this one is, we say STEMI or no STEMI, and I'd say no STEMI. The next question is, it's pretty irregular, our statement. So the question is, what do you do with this patient? What are you gonna do with this? It's not a STEMI, but it's definitely irregular. So it determines on their stability, right? So if the patient is awake, alert, blood pressure is fine, non-toxic, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to start an IV. I'm going to check an AccuCheck. I'm going to do pertinent history uh, questions, all right? And I'm going to transport to the hospital, and we can spend time to figure out what's going on with this, this really now. What do you do if this patient has a heart rate of this, this EKG, but a blood pressure of 80, and they're confused? That's where it gets scary, right? So what do y'all think is going on with this, this EKG? What does it look like? What if I said that at times she has a rate of 30 and she gets really sweaty and uncomfortable when it gets down to the 30s? So this was kind of mean, and it's also not a, one of the colored EKGs, so it's hard to see. So this person is having intermittent heart block. So we're having periods where we have complete heart block and then periods where we have good conduction. So textbooks talk about you have third degree heart block or you don't have third degree heart block. In reality, it's a spectrum. Sometimes people will have a high grade, secondary type two for a while. Sometimes they have intermittent third degree and you just don't know, right? So this patient 
is having an intermittent high-grade heart block. If they're stable, nothing to do but watch them. If they drop their pressure, the heart rate gets in the 40s, then you got to kind of manage the bradycardia, right? And the way I think about uh, the bradycardia management, we talked about too slow, we think about drugs, electrolyte, or ischemia. This is probably chronic ischemia, we didn't see a STEMI, right? Um, but the way we manage this is supportive care. So heart rate of 40, blood pressure of 80 altered. I'm going to go to easy things first, even atropine. Atropine doesn't work well in a complete heart block. But again, she's not always in a complete heart block. So atropine is easy to use, limited risk. It's one milligram. That doesn't work. Two is not going to help you. If one works, high five your partner, call it a good day, right? Atropine doesn't work. What's a drug we can give, an extra drug we can use for bradycardia? Anybody using push dose epi yet? Cool. So push dose epi, the state says we can do. It's a one to 100,000 dose epi. That's, I'm not a super big fan of it, but it does work. Anybody carry dopamine still? Yes, no, nobody even know. It comes in a bag, got red letters on it. Okay, cool, good. Make sure you know what it was. Good, thank you. So dopamine's great. Dopamine increases the heart rate, increases blood pressure. It's a titratable drug. So you spike it, you prime it, you hook it to the patient, you open it up. You get in a second IV, you talk to them for a few minutes. And about two minutes later, you look at the patient and reassess them. If their heart rate is up and blood pressure is better, you pull out your cheat sheet and you set it, right? The dose is two or five to 20 mics per kilo per minute. So set it in the middle at 10. If it doesn't work, cool. Pull out your book, figure out your rate, set it at 10 mics per kilo per minute and move on down to the next pathway, right? So dopamine doesn't work. You can always think about pacing these folks. Currently that's cat B in the state. Hope that changes. Another thing that I think about bradycardia is I give calcium because hyperkalemia is a cause of bradycardia. So in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, hyperkalemia causes bradycardia. Atropine didn't work. Fluids aren't making it better. Dopamine's not working. Maybe they're hyperkalemic. I'm going to give some calcium. All right. The point of this is if the patient is sick as dirt, we got to be aggressive. I don't care if it's a first degree, second degree, third degree heart block. If their heart rate is 30, they're symptomatic. We'll figure out what type of block they have at the hospital after cardiologists argue for two days. Right. If they're sick, we manage them. We treat them. Okay. If they're sick as dirt, we treat them. If they're not sick, we monitor get them to the hospital and we plan. So if they do get sick, I know what I'm gonna grab first, all right? So maybe if they're stable with that heart rate of 40 or complete heart block, I got my IV access started, get to the hospital, I'm breaking out my cheat sheet. I'm saying, okay, what drugs, what's my dose of dopamine, right? I'm getting ready for those things. This is the same patient after they got in and they got a pacemaker, so much better. It's amazing what a little electricity does. This is another one that's fairly irregular. So this is a patient complaining of palpitations. I would agree they have palpitations. I start off listening to too fast, too slow, or okay-ish. I would say it's too slow here and too fast here. Okay. I'm looking at injury patterns. I don't see a big freaking infarct. I'm looking at intervals, narrow QRS. My PR looks good there, looks there. My QT looks reasonable when I can see a QT, right? All right. So this is somebody that's having just kind of runs of dysrhythmia. And this could be intermittent sinus with an SVT. This could be somebody who has an atrial tachycardia that's intermittent. But again, am I going to give them something to slow this rate down, a denison or something? No, because they're too slow over here. This is something I'm going to watch until they kind of proclaim what is going to happen to them. Questions, comments, statements within reason so far? Anybody still awake? You're good. I got some people nodding their head and snoring. Thank you. Good. Cool. So the point of the 12 leads is it, it's a screening tool. It gives you information. You can determine are they having a STEMI or not a STEMI. You can determine if they're hyperkalemic. You can look for things that make people pass out. You can look for aortic stenosis because the EKG was normal. So now I'm going to listen to them for their syncope, right? So EKG gives you a lot of information. Very useful stuff. There's some good resources out there. Life in the Fast Lane is a good EMS blog for this. Uh, there are all kinds of resources. Um, Wave Maven is another good one. I would say if you're not looking at 12 leads every time you're on shift, you're not seeing enough. When I work at the main hospital down at UAB, I probably sign 20 or 30 a day. So I'm always looking at them. OK, if I were to get a vacation and go away for a few weeks, I'd probably look at them to make sure I stay up to date on them. All right. So you got to look at 12 leads. You got to understand those things. Um, are you going to feel bad sometime when you miss something on your patient? OK, and you don't have to get in the deep in the weeds. You don't have to understand the fancy things like Brigada 
left ventricular hypertrophy and all that stuff. Basically, it's STEMI, no STEMI, hyperkalemia, and then your rhythms. And if you can do that, you're going to save somebody's life someday. Remember with ketamine, if you get ketamine after they get it, they're a sick patient, they're a critical patient, assess them. Don't mess up on that airway. You will feel bad about it, okay? Questions, comments? We have like one minute left. I'm doing really good. Hey, Doc, we've got a couple of questions online. Yes, sir. So back to uh, talking earlier, I think one of the first cases, talking about getting a line so that if you dump the blood pressure, uh, somebody writes, why not fill the container and then give the nitro? In other words, why not give a fluid bolus first? That's reasonable, yes. So in, in real life, that's what I'm going to do. So I have somebody that's having a STEMI or having uh, the nausea, diaphoresis that looks poor. I'm going to start an IV access on them. I'm going to check my AccuCheck, and I'm hanging fluids, and I'm starting a bolus right then. So that seems very reasonable. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the next question is about surgical airway. Yes. Um, just basically saying, hey, he has Alabama put that in our scope of practice? It's in the critical care scope of practice. Yes. Right. It's also in the tactical scope of practice. But I would say, even though it's in that scope of practice, if you have not practiced it, please don't be cutting on people's necks until you get training. Just because it says you can doesn't mean that you can. And I'd also argue that there are not many neat times you have to do a surgical airway. Um, it's not a frequent thing. With the today's, with the video scopes that we have, the blind insertion devices, things like that, we should be managing airways without a scalpel for the most part. Now, sometimes you got to do it. Uh, but it should not be the routine. If you've got three surgical airways in the past two years, you can't intubate, you can't ventilate somebody with basic stuff. There's something wrong, right? Sorry. Yes. And got, got one more. So um, recommendations for symptomatic patients in AFib with slow ventricular response. Treat any underlying etiology and question mark? Yes. Right. So AFib is probably the most common dysrhythmia you're going to see in your career, okay? People think that AFib, <clears throat> AFib with a fast rate is usually secondary to some of the calls. So if I had AFib and I went out and I jogged in my truck and came back, I'd be in AFib with RVR in a fast rate. Just like if I don't have AFib, I have a sinus rhythm and I go out there and run. When I come back, I'll be in sinus tag. So most of the time with AFib and fast rates, you treat the underlying problem. Are they septic? Are they volume down? Have they been smoking some crack? What's going on before you start doing other drugs to slow the rate down? AFib with a slow rate in my brain, I think, okay, they have AFib and it's a slow rate. They're probably on a beta blocker for AFib to begin with or a calcium channel blocker. Now they're probably dehydrated and, they're, and their kidney function is off and they got too much of that medication. So I'm going to go down the same pathway for this bradycardia. I may consider atropine. I may consider dopamine. I'll probably give them some fluid boluses. I may consider calcium, especially if they're on a calcium channel blocker. Dr. Payne, you got anything to add? Other questions, comments, statements? I think that's all the slides I got. Hopefully nothing inappropriate pops up. Oh, I do have one more slide. There we go. So I got three rules for me, and I'm not saying you got to have these rules, but my rules are kind of simple. One, I try not to kill people, right? Um, they get you in trouble and you feel bad about it. Y'all carry a lot of medications that can help people, but you also carry medications that can hurt people. If you got somebody in a heart rate of 40 <clears throat> and a ventricular rhythm and you pull up and instead of atropine, you give them lidocaine, what happens to their heart rate? It slows to zero. Very good. Yeah, you basically just hurt somebody, right? So you have a lot of things out that can help people, but my rules, I don't kill people. I try and help people do the right thing. There are some things I cannot fix. If I recognize somebody has a head injury and they have blood in their brain, I cannot fix that. If I open up your skull to do surgery, you will die. There's no doubt, right? Um, but I should be able to recognize that injury and say, I got to get you to the appropriate place and talk to the appropriate person, right? <clears throat> if I recognize that injury and I attempt to get that person to the surgeon and that surgeon can't take care of them, can't find a bed for them, or doesn't get to me fast enough, I still couldn't fix that. I did my job, right? So I'm going to do everything I can to help that person from me because it's somebody's family, right? So I'm trying to help people do the right thing. And the last thing is I want to go home with a clear conscience because there's some things that you see in EMS and in the ER that will mess with your brain, right, and make you feel rough. So to go home with a clear conscience, what I do is I read, I plan, 
a train, okay? In my mind, I'm thinking about scenarios I can see in the hospital and what I would do with that. So I might be thinking one day, okay, I got an eight-year-old who has a traumatic head injury that needs a surgical airway. How am I going to do that? And I plan these scenarios in my head. I'm also looking at 12 leads. I'm reading information. I, I practice because I'm going to be able to go home with a clear conscience and know I did the right thing to help somebody, okay? So I think that's a cool picture of a doctor toy. I don't know why a stethoscope is attached to his groin, but it makes me feel really good about myself that that can happen. So I'm good with that. And uh, the dude in the middle is really, really funny. And he's inappropriate, but funny. And then you think about when people say EMS or healthcare providers, we are, you guys are, uh, but that's not saying enough. That's like calling this dude over here, you know, just a laborer. He's not just a laborer, right? He's a crazy man to be doing that job, right? So I appreciate the work that you guys do. You're making a difference. I know we got to change things at the state level. We got to change things legally, legislatively. We got to increase pay. There are a lot of things we got to do for you guys because the work you do is very important. Hopefully, one of the good things that comes out of this pandemic is that the citizens and the state realizes the work that you guys are doing, and we can change some things. So that's all I got. Thanks for smiling. Just take three or four minutes, then Dr. Payne will come talk. All right, guys. I think we're ready. We're going to get started. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about some chest trauma. We're going to talk, talk about penetrating trauma, uh, blunt trauma as well. Um, we're going to go through some of the basics of kind of the first things you look at when you come upon a patient with chest trauma. We are going to go into a little bit more detail. We, we try to target it at just above the paramedic level. So you'll be seeing some critical care level stuff. And then also we'll just go over a few things that we do in the emergency department when the patients come immediately in, uh, just because it's good for you all to know kind of what the pathway is and what we're thinking about as well when we see these patients. So just, just like any other trauma patient, right, you're going to perform your primary survey, right? You're going to look for immediate life threats, okay? So you're going to do your A, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and expose the patient, okay? It's the same thing we do when a patient comes into the trauma bay. We're looking for those immediate life threats, right? So A, airway, you come up to the patient, you're going to assess, are they breathing? Uh, is there something obstructing them or is there some massive trauma to the face, right? Does the patient just need a simple jaw thrust to make sure they can start breathing at that point, um, especially in uh, traumatic brain injury patients? B, are they breathing? This is uh, where you're going to also be looking for uh, pneumothorax or attention pneumothorax. We're going to talk about all these things more in detail. C, circulation, right? So are they bleeding out massively somewhere? Um, you do you need to throw a tourniquet on an extremity? Um, disability, so are there any neurological deficits or they have a massive, or have a massive uh, traumatic brain injury and that's why they're altered and then E exposure, right? It's really important to expose these patients uh, so you don't miss, especially in penetrating trauma, okay? And then after you do that, you're going to do a secondary survey, just going head to toe after you've looked for immediate life threats to see what other injuries they have um, so that you can treat those as well, okay? So these are kind of the rapid things we can do during the ABCDE um, that can potentially save the patient, right? So needle decompression, we're going to talk about that more in detail. What, uh, when to do it, how to do it, you know, what, what are the reasons and what things we do in the ER afterwards for those uh, specific uh, causes. Intubation, right, for uh, flail chest, for TBI, various reasons why a patient might need intubation in a, a traumatic setting. And then per pericardiocentesis, so that's what we're going to do in somebody with a traumatic uh, cardiac tamponade, either from blunt or penetrating trauma when they come into the bay. So we'll just talk about that briefly as well. Okay, to start, we need to go over just some brief chest anatomy. I promise you I won't bore you, but of course, we've got the rib cage here. you got the large sternum in the middle. Um, you have the ribs. Uh, it's always good to think about the, the spine in the back and the ribs kind of contour around and down. So when you're looking for those rib spaces, when you're feeling ribs in the front, it's going to be lower down from the spine in the back. So it's just good to thing to think about. Uh, you have the maneuverum at the top, and then you have your uh, scapula around back. Why this is important? So when you're doing the needle compression, which we'll talk about a little more, remember the sites, right? So mid-clavicular line, second intercostal space, or uh, the space added in uh, mid-axillary line, fifth intercostal space on the side. Okay, we'll go over some more images, but this is kind of why I put this uh, image in here. So when you talk about the, the chest cavity itself, um, you know, you have uh, inside the rib cage, you have the lungs on each side, you have the pericardium, which is the sac that sits around the heart, um, which we'll talk about with cardiac tamponade. You can see the lungs kind of surround the heart on each side. Um, you have the, the, the trachea and the airway structure is going to be behind the great vessels. So you see the aorta 
an aortic arch uh, coming around here, right here, okay? And then you're going to have the trachea, trachea and tracheobronchial tree that sits right behind it, okay? So very, very close together. And then behind that, you have the esophagus, okay? So all these things can be injured in either penetrating or blunt trauma. So it's just things to think about. Um, one of the things that you'll hear is the cardiac box, right? So that's going to be kind of this area, right? The box around the heart. So any penetrating trauma to, to this area is going to be very deadly and very deadly uh, quickly. So, uh, and talking about the lung fields, especially, uh, we've got to talk about the pleural space, right? So the pleural space is the space in between the parietal and the visceral pleura. So there's a pleura on the side of the lungs, on the side of the ribs, that is exactly directly in contact with the visceral pleura, which is the part of the lungs, right? So normally there's no space here, right? This is what we call a potential space. So when you have a pneumothorax, that area is going to fill up with air, either from a injury from the outside coming in or an injury to the lung itself, okay? But in a normal patient, those two um, pleura are going to be touching each other, and that's what's going to cause the inspiration and expiration of the lungs is that suction effect from the pleura, okay? So you got to remember this is a potential space. It's not there normally, okay? You can see here we got the hilum where the lungs uh, come together into the, the, the bronchus over here in the middle. Um, so let's talk about chest decompression sites. So we already we already talked about it once. So uh, midclavicular line, second intercostal space, or uh, mid axillary line, uh, fifth rib space. Okay, um, you've probably heard this, but there's the nerve and vascular bundle that runs right up under the ribs. So each rib has a neurovascular bundle that runs up underneath it. So when you try to um, pop these patients' lungs, we recommend going over the ribs. So that's minimizing the chance of you damaging those structures under the rib. Okay. Uh, just a little bit more anatomy. Um, you all know this, but you have the ventr ventricles of the heart at the bottom, atria at the top. You have the great vessels. What we mean by that is the aorta and the, the pulmonary vessels. So those are going to be coming over the top and arcing, arching down behind the heart. Okay. And then you have your carotid vessels and your um, subclavian vessels that come off the top of the aorta as well, okay? This is looking at a side view. You can see how the, the aorta wraps around and comes right beside the spine, and it also comes close to the esophagus and the trachea. All those are kind of there sitting in the mediastinum or the middle part of the chest, okay? All right, so we're going to go kind of shift gear from anatomy. We're going to look at different exam findings that you will see in chest trauma, okay? So this guy obviously has massive bruising. This could be uh, any kind of blunt trauma. This could be a crush injury if he was working under a car. This could be an MVC itself. So you'll see this sometimes. Um, so this is the big one to look for when you're, when you're looking at the patient's chest, right? So this is subcutaneous emphysema. So by definition, uh, this means that there's air outside of the chest wall, okay? So they have a pneumothorax. If you see this, guaranteed they have a pneumothorax, okay? Because the air has got to come from somewhere. You'll feel, you can see it on the right side of this picture. Um, you can press and it feels like the Rice Krispies that, that you've probably heard of. It really does feel like this, the crepitus that you feel. Um, and if you see this, this is going to in, usually indicate a significant amount of force and trauma to the patient, okay? So this patient is definitely going to get a chest tube when you come into the ER, and you've got to be watching out for signs of tension on this guy, right? So the whole way you're transporting, you've got to be looking out for those signs of tension to see if you need to pop that chest. So this, this is kind of a cool slide. So this is just a, a plain film or x-ray of the chest. On the left is a normal x-ray. So if you've never looked at x-rays before, the white uh, is uh, opacities or bony structures. Um, and then air or lung tissue, which is usually filled with air, is black. Okay. So you can see on the left, you have a nice lung field. They're black. You can see the heart there in the middle. And then on this right side, you can see all this kind of black looking material that's outside the rib cage. So all that is actually subcutaneous air. This is this is a pretty bad case. Um, you can see. Uh, so what happens is the air will will track outside of the lung fields and it will find these little planes in the skin and it'll just keep tracking along the skin. So it can track down into the abdomen. You can see it tracking up into the neck as well. OK, so all that sub Q air there on the outside. Um, we can talk about a, a flail chest um, real quick. I think we're going to go uh, into it a little bit further here in a minute. But again, a flail chest is going to be where you have basically rib fractures in two separate segments. So you have a, fleet, a free floating segment of ribs. Okay. 
Um, if I can get a video to pull up, I got a, a cool video that shows a couple different patients um, with flail chest. Um, so I'll hold off on that. We'll talk about that here in a little while. All right, so we're going to talk about specific injuries and how to manage those specific injuries, okay? So pulmonary uh, and chest wall injuries, okay? So rib fractures, you see these a good portion of the time, right? It could just be a simple fall at a nursing home. Um, grandma has fallen and now she's having some pain in the side and she has a simple rib fracture, right? So th these can, can sound simple, but they can actually be pretty severe for patients, especially elderly patients, right? So anytime you have a rib fracture, it's going to be very painful and you, uh, the patients are not going to want to take in a deep breath because of that pain, right? So, so what happens when you have an old person that's unhealthy at baseline, you know, they're not taking in those deep breaths, that just sets up for infection within the lung fields, right? So we actually admit a lot of these patients to the hospital to watch them and do uh, pulmonary exercises for them to keep them from developing pneumonia, okay? And we get really aggressive with pain control on these patients. There's, uh, there's some fancy things. You can do some nerve blocks uh, in the hospital to try to just keep the pain down. And all that is is trying to prevent infection. Um, so the rib fractures themselves, if they break, like I said, there's that neurovascular bundle that runs up underneath the rib, so it can it can injure the vessels there, and you can have bleeding into the chest wall just from a rib fracture. So you can get a hemothorax just from that. So this one we talked about a, a flail flail chest or flail segment. So um, the classic presentation is you'll see that paradoxical movement, right? So um, instead of when somebody takes in a breath, of both sides of the chest expanding, you'll see the part that has the flail segment actually depress and go into the chest, okay? Because the, the chest works by creating a negative pressure within the chest. That's what causes the lungs to expand. Well, if you don't have that rib cage there to support the outside, that negative pressure is just going to suck that part of the chest in. Um, it can be very painful. It can cause oxygenation and ventilation issues. A lot of the times these patients are just ultimately going to have to be intubated. Um, to switch over from negative pressure to then positive pressure ventilation on the vent, okay, until their ribs can heal or they can go to surgery and have rib plating done, okay. Either way, this, this indicates a large amount of force, okay. So you got to be thinking of all the other bad things that could happen when you see these injuries. All right, let me see if I can get this to work. Sorry, guys. One second. Do you know if there's a great way to switch over, Wes? I got it up here. Okay. Okay. All right. I don't. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get that to work. Sorry, guys. Um, ah, sorry, I messed up here. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, so flail, flail segment again, just remember it's going to be a lot of force uh, that they're going to be in respiratory stress. They're going to need intubation at some point. Okay. Uh, so pulmonary and chest wall injury. So pneumothorax is Fairly common. You can get uh, simple pneumothoraces. You can get spontaneous ones not even related to trauma. You see these a lot in, in older patients with COPD. They'll pop a bleb and you'll get a pneumothorax that way. Or if you see a younger guy that's really tall, they might have some underlying connective tissue disorder that can get spontaneous pneumo that way as well. But in this situation, we're talking about specifically traumatic pneumothorax, okay? So simple pneumothorax is going to be less than 10% of the lung volume or the chest wall volume. Um, sometimes those can, those can be managed without a chest tube. We'll just put them in the, in the hospital and just kind of watch it, uh, give them some supplemental oxygen, and that will allow that lung to just reabsorb that extra air over time. But most of the time in a traumatic setting, you're going to have greater than 10 percent, um, and it's going to require a chest tube. Okay, we'll talk about the reasons why we need that. And then, of course, the most feared complication of a pneumothorax is the tension pneumothorax, which uh, can lead quickly to death if not, if not fixed, okay? So what is a pneumothorax, right? So it's an injury to the lung or the rib cage that causes that potential space in between the two different pleuras to come to become filled with air now. Okay, that's all it is. 
So why is this bad? So the, the lung injury uh, itself can create a one-way valve within the chest. So every time the patient breathes in or out, a little bit of air will escape the lung fields and enter that potential space, right? But now you have some pressure in that potential space. It's not going to allow that air to go back into the lungs, okay? So you can think about that's going to create a one-way valve mechanism and that every time they breathe, it's going to add a little bit more air, a little bit more air, a little bit more air. And eventually that's going to be enough pressure to start pushing on your heart, which is what actually causes the issues, right? <clears throat> so how do we fix this, right? How do you fix a pneumothorax? Well, in the ER, we're going to put in a chest tube if it's greater than 10%, right? So you can see we make a little incision on the side, we put a chest tube in, and all we're doing is putting it in that potential space to evacuate either air or blood, okay? And that's going to allow time for that lung uh, tissue to heal itself, to not allow any more air out. OK, that's all we're doing It's a temporary thing. This also prevents a tension, right? So uh, we're, we're releasing that built up pressure and air within the chest cavity. So we're preventing a tension pneumothorax. So when a tension, when a, a pneumothorax gets large enough, there's no way for that air to escape. It will eventually press over on the medial spinal structures and it will cause hemodynamic instability and ultimately uh, death. OK, so that's what we're trying to prevent. So this is an X-ray. Uh, you can see. On the left, uh, let me get my little pointer up here. You see on the left here, there's a there's a, like a thin line right here. If you can see it, that's not on this side, right? So that's going to be the actual the, the edge of the lung field, okay? So this area right in through here is the pneumothorax, okay? You can see not that big, right? Um, and then this is a, another picture a little time later. You can see. This is actually the lung pressed up again. So the lung is fully collapsed now. This whole chest wall right here, this chest cavity is filled with air, right? You can see a little bit of a mediastinal shift coming over, right? So this is why we try, we, this is why we teach to look for tracheal deviation, right? Because that pressure is actually going to press the mediastinal structures over, right? And then this over here is, is, is the end game, right? So this is actual tension, right? You see how much this whole mediastinum is pressed over to the side? It's, you can see the whole spinal column now because this is totally filled with air. There's no way for it to escape and it's pressing on the heart. And you can see how this creates enough pressure where it's just the heart is not able to pump anymore. So that's why you get the tachypnea, you get the tachycardia, you get hypotension, and then ultimately a code or arrest, right? So this is what you're trying to prevent by, um, by decompressing the chest, okay? So tension pneumothorax is an immediate life threat and it requires chest decompression immediately, okay? So these are exam findings. You'll see tachypnea, respiratory distress. Of course, you'll see decreased breath sounds on that side, right? Because that's the pneumothorax. Tachycardia hypotension, uh, that's what ultimately kills. It's not a breathing issue necessarily. It's not an oxygenation issue. It's a cardiac output issue, okay? So it's hypotension, it's hemodynamic instability is the issue, what you're trying to resolve. You'll see tracheal deviation, but again, that's going to be a very late finding, right? So if you see that, you know you're already uh, got to get ready to, to pop along. Uh, distended neck veins, that's what's typically, typically uh, taught with this. Again, those distended neck veins, because you're putting the pressure on the venous side of the heart, it's going to back up the, your venous return into your veins, and that's what gives the distended neck veins. Ultimately, arrest, you'll see PEA arrest normally because the heart still has electrical activity. It's trying to pump. It's just an obstructive shock, right? It's not able to pump with all the pressure in the chest. So talk about needle, needle decompression more. Um, some places have the, the special little uh, needle de decompression devices, right? That comes a little kit. They're longer. Uh, you can use a 14 gauge angio catheter. Um, some of uh, the 14 gauges come with a metal, metal uh, catheter on it, not a plastic catheter. Those are really nice, right? So the chest wall is not going to compress that little plastic catheter. Um, you can do it with a 10cc syringe, uh, so you can go in um, in those two spaces that we talked about. Um, while you're going in, you can withdraw. When you see air come back on the syringe, that's when you know you're in. But again, if you think about it, if you're doing this for attention pneumo, which is why you're doing it, there's going to be a lot of built up pressure in that chest wall. So as soon as you get into the chest cavity, you're going to hear a whoosh of air, right? Just like that, right? So that's that's how you know, one, you did it, you, there was attention pneumo, and also you just fixed the problem, okay? You leave these in the chest all the way to the hospital, right? Because you, if you take it back out, that same process is still there. So it's just going to develop back up over time. So you leave the catheter in. If you're on the way to the hospital and the patient starts deteriorating again and looks like they have another tension, just take a look at the catheter. Maybe it's kinked. 
maybe it's it's come out, it's not in the chest again. So you can either pop them again, or if you can try to manipulate the catheter so you can get air out. Okay, you're trying to leave that air able to escape the chest. Again, as we talked about before, um, so the rib space numbers are below the rib. That vascular bundle is right there below the rib. So when you feel feel for rib, go right over it. That way you'll miss the all the neurovascular area there. Um, so these again, we talked about just to, to reiterate it again, you have your, your midclavicular line, the second intercostal space, that's going to be your anterior approach up here, and then mid-axillary line. Okay, there's, uh, you, usually, used to we always would go up here, um, some, some places are going mid-axillary more. Um, I like both. Uh, sometimes you'll have issues with obese patients not actually being able to go all the way into the chest on the side, so it might be more beneficial to go up here. Um, but also when we go to, uh, when you bring the patient into the trauma bay, we're going to be putting in a chest tube right here in that same spot anyway. So that's kind of why, um, I like this side as well. So it's whichever one, you just got to get used to it. Um, we'll talk about in a minute, the triangle of safety for the, uh, mid axillary approach and what things to look at. Okay. Right here. So in the bottom of this picture. Um, you'll hear it is the triangle of safety, right? So you have the your pectoris muscle coming up here. You probably won't be able to see it on most people. And then you have your lap muscle here. And then you have your, your nipple line, okay? Anything in here, any of the green here, that's going to be your triangle of safety. The risk in the mid-axillary line is going too low, okay? So you can actually go into the abdomen um, or you can image, uh, damage the diaphragm if you go too low. So just think about nipple line and above when you're when you're going in this area. OK, again, that mid axillary line right in here. Uh, this is just an example of those kits you might see. So this is a specific pneumothorax kit. A lot of the tactical paramedic guys will carry this. Um, it's really nice just because it's a long needle, right? So you got to get through that chest wall. And if you don't have the right size angio cat, it might be difficult getting through the chest wall. So these are nice. This is just an example of, of going in. So this is actually it looks like putting in a, a what we call a pneumocath in the ho in the hospital for a, like a simple pneumothorax, but it's the same thing as a needle decompression. So you can see feeling for the rib there, and then just going right over the rib. So you can think about the ribs laying here, and going right over the ribs there. And again, nipple line, triangle of safety here. Stay there. And then when we uh, just to kind of go over the, the the tube thoracostomy, which is a chest tube, this is what we're going to do in the trauma bay, right? So we're doing the same thing. It's just we're actually going to be leaving the tube in to evacuate that air. Okay, so we're going to be doing a surgical cut down, a little scalpel. We're going to be dissecting through the tissue and then putting in a large bore uh, chest tube that's going to sit in the chest wall there. And this is just a little schematic looking at how we do it. We palpate the rib make a little incision through the skin. We usually, you'll hear people talk about a, a finger thoracostomy, which you, you put in your finger to get in that uh, chest wall, and you'll do a finger sweep, um, and then you'll put in the, the tube itself, put some Vaseline gauze over it, and then suture it down, and that's all we're doing, right? Okay, so open, open pneumothorax or sucking chest wound. So you'll see these with, you know, penetrating trauma, GSWs, they can be pretty large, especially if it's like a, some type of shotgun injury. You'll see these sometimes. They'll have a sucking or a blowing mechanism. Um, the good things with these is you're not going to have a tension pneumothorax with this, right? Because you have air being able to enter and leave the chest. The only issue is you have so much air entering, the, that lung is not going to expand when the patients take a, in a, a breath. It's going to be totally collapsed. So that's why we teach putting on the three-sided occlusive dressing for these, right? So you're going to be creating a, a one-way valve that allows uh, air out, but not in. So this is an example of that, the three-way dressing. Again, so when patients exhale, they can, air can leave, but air cannot go back in. That's the whole reason for the three-sided dressing for sucking chest wounds. So again, talking about uh, uh, different pulmonary uh, injuries, um, hemothorax is very common. Uh, very common with penetrating trauma, but you'll see it with blunt as well. Um, usually it's from a direct cost to, to the lung and then the lung itself bleeds. Sometimes you can have the higher structures or the great vessels will be injured in penetrating trauma that will bleed into the chest. Okay, and you got to think about each each chest side here. Each hemithorax can hold about 
almost half of the circulating blood. Okay, so you can get hypotensive and bleed out just from bleeding into your lung. Not to mention the fact that now you've got so much blood you can't oxygenate because your lung can't expand. All right, so a lot of badness. So here's an x-ray on a guy that was shot in the chest. You can see the bullet there. Um, it's kind of hard to tell because you can't see a lateral if it's anterior or posterior, but you can see that whole left side of the chest, right? Instead of being black and pretty like the other side, it's white. Right. So all that white is blood filling the, fill the chest wall. That's a, that's a huge hemothorax that's going to get a chest tube immediately, right? So hemothorax, um, we treat it the same as hemothorax. We're going to be putting in a chest tube to evacuate all that blood. Um, you can hear about attention hemothorax. It's very rare, but it's the same physiology. You just have so much blood built up in the chest that it presses on the mediastinal structures and causes cardiac collapse that way. It's very rare. Um, it's going to be difficult to treat with a, with, by decompressing with a needle just because the blood is not going to evacuate that well through a needle. Um, so this is going to require a large blood chest tube. So putting in a, this is just kind of for critical care um, kind of stuff, but when you put in a chest tube, there's some definitions that we look at to see is, is this a massive hemothorax? And why we do that is because um, that's going to make the determination of whether we go to the OR emergently with the, with the surgeons, right? So it's usually defined as greater than a liter and a half of blood um, out of the chest tube, okay? So the life threats by massive hemothorax, again, we kind of talked about a volume loss just from the blood itself that you're losing. Uh, you can, you're going to have that whole side collapse, so you're not going to be ventilating or oxygenating half of your lung, right? And then attention hemothorax, even though it's rare, it can't happen. Most uh, people with blood in the chest, they can do fine once we get the blood out with a chest tube. Um, whatever is bleeding in there will kind of heal up on its own. About 5% of the patients do have to go to the OR, though, to have an operation to fix whatever vessel is bleeding or to go in with a camera and remove the blood in the chest, okay? Um, so flight medics out there, you know, if, if you're transporting a patient and they got a chest tube at the hospital and you're transporting them in route and they got uh, 100 cc's coming out, right? you're going to be giving them blood, right? You're going to be pounding them with blood. Say you don't have blood, right? So there's the idea of a last ditch effort that you can clamp off the tube at about a liter of blood out. Again, you got to watch to make sure there's not blood backing up to create that tension hemothorax, but this is just going to be a desperate attempt to keep them from exanuating and bleeding out from that, okay? Greater than a liter of half uh, output is an uh, indication that the trauma surgeon is using the bay to immediately take them up to the OR, okay? No playing around, no saying, oh, let's see if we can just let the place heal up on its own. If you get a liter and, out, a, liter and a half output of blood out of the chest tube, that's immediately to the OR. Okay, just talk about a few other injuries. Uh, so this is more with the ventilation side, okay? So we're moving away from kind of hemothorax, pneumothorax, and talk about tracheal bronchial tree injury. So this is actually an injury to the, the, the um, ventilation apparatus you can think of, the trachea and the bronchia, right? Usually in either penetrating or blunt especially, you can have uh, so much um, trauma or uh, pressure that it actually will twist or it can, it can fracture that trachea and you could get big injuries and this, these can kill people very quickly, okay? Often due to rapid deceleration injuries, usually they occur close to the carina or the trachea divides into the two bronchi right here just because of that triangulation. Um, these patients are going to have dyspnea, right, because they got a hole in their either trachea or bronchi. Um, you could see subcutaneous emphysema. They could have pneumothorax. Um, and then you can see pneumomediastinum, and we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So a tracheal bronchial injury is an air leak due to a bronchopleural uh, fistula, right? So if you put in a chest tube and the chest tube just keeps putting out a ton of air, you can think about it, that air is coming in through the patient that's breathing, either event or spontaneously, and then it's going right out that hole that's in the trachea, going right out through the chest tube, and you'll see massive amounts of air coming out of the chest tube, and that's an indication that you have a, a trachea or bronchial injury. So as far as mediastinal injuries, um, you know, there's not a lot to do in the pre-hospital setting for these. These can be pretty severe. Um, a vast majority of the patients, if you come up on a wreck and it's a, a blunt trauma, obvious bad blunt trauma, and they're already deceased by the time you get there, usually these are just devastating aortic injuries. Okay. We'll talk about different specific ones. So you see great vessel injuries. So when I say great vessel, I mean aorta, the big pulmonary vasculature right there on the front of your, front of your heart, 
pulmonary trunk, pulmonary veins, subclavian veins and arteries that go out to your arms. Okay, so that's when I say great vessels, that's what I mean. So when you get injuries to these, you're going to have swift hemorrhagic shock. You're going to be bleeding into the chest. Most patients will die before reaching medical care. If you have a traumatic aortic injury from blunt trauma, so not penetrating trauma necessarily, but from blunt trauma, 90% of these patients will die at the scene. Okay, there's really not a lot you can do for these. Of the 10% that survives at the hospital, half of those are going to die within 24 hours, just because the surgery to try to repair that is, is almost unsurvivable as well. Okay. The treatment, of course, um, if you're a critical care paramedic, you can give blood transfusion, but rapid transport uh, to definitive, definitive care and definitive care and OR is going to be the thing that saves these people. So mediastinal injuries, pneumomediastinum, I got a picture on the next slide that we're going to look at that looks specifically at pneumomediastinum. Um, you can see subcutaneous emphysema up into the neck. Again, this is going to be a sign that you have likely some injury to the tracheobronchial trick, right? You can see Hammond sign, uh, which I, I, I've never heard it personally, but you, it's, it's a crunching of air when you listen to the chest. So every time they, the heart beats, you can hear kind of a crunching. That's the sound of the air and the, the pericardium there, or the mediastinum, rather. So here on the left, uh, we have a plain film. If you can see this very thin black line around the heart, so that's actually air inside the mediastinum around the heart, okay? So that's pneumomediastinum. And then over here we have CT scans, so you're looking at slices of the body in a transverse plane. So you think about it as slices of the body like this, going all the way down. So again, on a CT, this black, you can see lung here, so black is air. And then you can see all this air in here, so that's not supposed to be there. And you can see air around the heart as well here. And then if you see here, this is the, the uh, mediastinum around the heart. So that's air within the mediastinum. So think about other mediastinal injuries. You can have esophageal injuries, perforation. Um, usually these are due to penetrating trauma. You won't see these as much in blunt trauma. Uh, mortality is very high in these. If you think about it, if you have an injury to the esophagus, anything you've eaten recently, um, anything that can be uh, that's in the stomach itself is going to be coming out of that injury and just dumping into your mediastinum. So it's just going to be setting up for infection. Okay, so these people can get septic; they can get sick pretty quickly. Uh, blunt injuries we can we can talk about as well. So uh, up to about 20% of all MBC deaths are related to blunt cardiac trauma itself. You can get a, a dysarrhythmia from just the the insults from the blunt trauma. You can have a cardiac contusion. You can actually have a free wall rupture, which is, uh, you, you know, it's going to lead to death pretty quickly, or you can have valvular injuries as well. So one of the things I want to talk about quickly with blunt cardiac injury um, is a condition called commotio cordis. Um, so you will see this as a, any kind of impact to the chest. You'll see, and you can go on YouTube, there's videos of this happening to baseball players like pictures. So they'll get hit in the chest with a baseball and just collapse. Um, so the mechanism is it's actually an electrical issue. So you get that intense trauma to the chest right over the heart um, and you can get, it's called an R on T phenomenon, but basically it will send you into V-fib just from that impact to the chest, okay? So if you ever see this, um, it happens in hockey, baseball, um, you, you, uh, you can look and there's some in boxing as well. So if you get like a kick to the chest and somebody just collapses immediately, this is what you got to think about, right? So you got to be quick with the AED with these patients because they're in they're in V-fib. It's the second most common uh, second most common cause of sudden death uh, in athletes aside, aside from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that Dr. Ferg talked about er earlier, hokum. Okay, so it's the second most common thing that causes sudden cardiac death. So something to think about if you see this on the baseball field, think I got to get to an AED to this person right away because they're in V-fib. All right, again, cardiac injuries, hemopericardium. Um, so this is where we're going to be talking about cardiac tamponade. So the pericardium is a small sac around the heart. It usually does not have any fluid in it. It's, again, usually a little potential space with a little bit of uh, fat in it. It usually doesn't have any fluid, but it can fill with fluids and cause issues. Um, it can be from penetrating or blunt trauma. So uh, cardiac tamponade itself is found, about, and it's found in about 2% of penetrating trauma in general to the chest. However, if you have a penetrating trauma injury to the box or the cardiac box, 
then uh, you're very likely to get tamponade issues here. So you can think about as blood fills that space, um, you're going to have right to left ventricles that um, it's going to shift and put pressure on the right side of the heart, right, because that's the lower sided pressure, and that's going to keep all the blood from being transferred from the right to left side and being pumped out, so you have the cardiac output, right? So as the space gets more and more full, you get more and more pressure, you're going to get catecholamines released, right? You're going to get your bodies on epinephrine released to try to stimulate your heart rate to go up. Um, and ultimately, you'll have a downward spiral after the tachycardia into death. And you got to remember that it's a very small area, so it doesn't have to be a lot of blood that causes this. About 50 to 100 cc's is all you need um, to, to result in enough pressure that will um, keep the heart from pumping out blood. So really, it's going to be very difficult to diagnose without an ultrasound. OK, we we fast people a lot when uh, patients come in through the trauma bay. And this is one of the key things we're looking for initially to see if we need to do something right away is we're looking for um, uh, blood around the heart to see if we need to do a pericardial synthesis for tamponade. OK, you will see tachycardia, hypotension again. That's going to be right before they code usually. You'll hear Beck triad, which is um, classically taught as a presentation for um, tamponade, which is muffled heart sounds, right? You're going to have fluid around the heart, so it's going to sound muffled, hypotension, and then distended neck veins. Again, just like a tension pneumothorax, you have backup of fluid into the venous uh, system, so that's going to cause the veins in your neck to distend, okay? It's, it's classically taught, but again, it's less than 10% of cases that present this way. So it's, it's increasingly difficult to diagnose with that ultrasound. You can see a narrow, a narrow pulse pressure um, as well. So you, uh, so you, you know, you're taught about electrical alternands, or I, I don't know if y'all have heard of this before, but it's a, it's related to a swinging of the heart back and forth within the fluid. It's not specific to tamponade. You can see it with somebody with just a, a, a pericardial fusion, say they're a kidney failure patient, um, or they're a cancer patient, and they just have chronic fluid around the heart. You can see it as well. So this is kind of what it looks like. Besides this rhythm being super fast and everything else, this is kind of an example of what you may see. So you can see how the, 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 the peaks of the R's are all different levels. Um, it won't look this pretty in real life, but you can see how it's a different amplitude for each R, and that's going to mean the heart swinging back and forth. So that's called electrical alternance that you may see. So again, what we do in the trauma bay, um, when we have somebody that's going into cardiac tamponade is we got to remove that blood from the pericardial space, right? So we actually take a, a syringe with a long needle on it, usually under ultrasound guidance. We go right up under the rib space, right into the pericardial space, and we just pull off that blood, okay? Again, that's really not going to necessarily fix the underlying issue, so we might have to do it over again. Ultimately, these patients just have to go to the OR. They'll get a pericardial window where they'll just open up the pericardial sac, so there, there won't be any uh, space uh, able for the pressure to build up. Okay, let me talk about ultrasound real quick. So ultrasound, we use it a lot in the trauma bay. Um, it might, over the next few years, be coming to the pre-hospital setting, especially with handheld ultrasound devices. So you'll probably be seeing this used more. Um, it's really good because it tells us a lot of things and it tells us a lot of things quickly, okay? So what the biggest thing we're looking at in a trauma patient when we're ultrasounding them is what is killing my patient, right? Where is the blood if they're hypotensive? Where is the blood at? Is it in their abdomen? Is it in their chest? Um, there are specific sites we look at. You can see here on the left where the usual spaces and all we're looking at is different areas in the abdomen that blood collects, okay, to say, yes, there's blood in the abdomen. We need to go this way to the OR. <clears throat> You can also look for a pneumothorax as well. Um, there's some techniques you can use. Uh, one of them is called lung sliding. Um, there's a lot of good educational videos on YouTube you can look at to see what's actually normal versus abnormal uh, ultrasound findings. But it's, it's good to know about at least because I think it is going to be coming to the pre-hospital setting sometime in the near future. But this is a quick way to look for a pneumothorax, right? Besides your clinical exam, right? You're going to be listening for breath sounds, looking for other signs. This is another way to confirm yes or no, there is a pneumothorax on this side, okay? Um, and then the last thing we can look for, that pericardial tamponade, tamponade that I talked about. So if you look in this right picture, you can see the heart here. This is um, looking like the heart is upside down, so you have your atrium at the bottom here and your ventricles at the top, 
and you can see all this black around here. So that's all extra fluid build up in the pericardial space. And that's pushing right here where this arrow is. That's pushing on the right side of the heart, the right ventricle. And you can see how that just totally collapses this ventricle and doesn't allow any blood to pump out. OK, so that's what we're looking at. So in general, you know, the quick things you want to think about a trauma patient. When you go through your ABCs, look for things that are immediate life threats, right? In the general trauma patient, you're going to look for airway issues, breathing issues. Um, and then specifically in chest trauma, you're going to be thinking about pneumothorax, right? Are they having tension physiology, right? Are they coding because of that? Or they're having hemodynamic instability that I need to pop their chest, right? Um, if you're a critical care paramedic, you're going to be thinking about, I got to give these people blood. I might be transferring these patients with a chest tube in. I got to be looking at how much blood is coming out of the chest tube, right? Don't forget after you um, decompress the chest that to keep monitoring that needle, leave it in while you're transporting, right? Make sure that it stays uh, uh, where there's air able to come in and out, right? You might have to pop them again. Um, yeah, so, so that's all I had in general. Any questions? We got any questions online? Well, yeah, hey, uh, got a couple. So first one is um, trying to understand this one. I'll just read it to you like they wrote it. They said, is there such a thing as blood seeping into the lungs during extensive cardio exercise, leading someone to, quote, taste blood? If so, does this pose any particular risk? That sounds very specific. I'm not sure. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, yeah, there there's got to be a story there. there. I have no idea. I've never heard of that. Never heard of that. I would yeah. I would have to defer to my wiser colleagues on this. I would think that you would either have to have some kind of injury to the conducting passageways of the lungs or you're bleeding your belly. And if, if you're exercising enough or you have injury to the lungs that starts bleeding, then I think you have other issues going on. So. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, <laughs> I think you're right there as well. You just can't use that as an excuse not to exercise. That's my advice. So. <laughs> The next one's kind of interesting, and this is referring to uh, when you talked about the the folks in the trauma bay looking at a liter of blood um, coming from the chest tube. They asked, do you take into account the patient's body weight and the 30% rule when making the choice to go straight to the OR, or is it just a straight volume loss? It's a straight, it's a straight yes or no. One and a half liters, they're going to go up. Yeah, well, you know, with, within reason, right? In the pediatric setting, of course, it's going to be different, but in setting is going to be that. Got you. Uh, the other one is, do you ever foresee EMS crews doing pericardial synthesis? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think. Um, you know, maybe in the critical care setting, if you're at a transfer facility doing it, assisting, but I, I, don't, I don't see it unless Berg has some other. Seems like potholes would be really dangerous there. Yeah, it's it's a, you know, it's a, it's a kind of and uh, it's a last ditch effort anyway. It's a very, especially if you don't have an ultrasound, it's a very, uh, you know, difficult procedure to do, so. I think that um, once ultrasounds are out there and people are used to using those and you can recognize these, there's a chance that's going to come into play. I think right now there's really not much reason. Um, I do think ultrasounds are coming soon. We're buying them for the uh, primary schools, the paramedic programs. Some of the new guys coming out are going to understand them better. Uh, we good, sir? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so I think in the future that's a potential. I think the bigger potential is using the ultrasounds for like fast pneumothoraxes and things of that nature. I will say that my opinion for what it's worth, we probably are missing some tension pneumos we're not popping in the field. Um, and I think we got to probably focus on that first because that's a clinical diagnosis, right? And you defined it pretty good earlier. Tension pneumothorax is you got somebody that has reasons to have a pneumothorax. So obviously they have chest trauma, they're hypoxic, diminished breath sounds, and now they have signs of tension. And by signs of tension, they're either in cardiac arrest, because that's bad tension, right? Poor cardiac output, right? Or they're altered and have poor perfusion. In the past, we've used a blood pressure is a way to determine that. But I would say, I would argue that if you think somebody has a pneumothorax and they're altered and you're having trouble finding a pulse and you spend five minutes getting the blood pressure, we're probably doing the wrong thing. So I would say that we probably need to work more on management attention pneumothoraxes before we start pushing for pericardial tamponade. I can think 
in my experience of three times that it's been done once in trauma two in medical and it was after we tried everything else and realized oh well crap now i know what's going on right so it's kind of it's not a common thing yeah i think it's worth mentioning too that sometimes patients can develop tension pneumothorax from blunt trauma like in mbas and we tend not to think of, or i'll speak for myself I tend to think tension pneumothorax with gunshot wound with penetrating trauma, but it also happens in blunt trauma. Right. It also happens in your medical patient. So if you got a 25-year-old healthy firefighter doing chest compressions on a 70-year-old person for cardiac arrest, and you get ROSC, and now all of a sudden they're hard to bag, their SATs drop, and their pressure drops, you probably should be thinking tension pneumothorax because you probably broke ribs and punctured something. So that's blunt trauma too, right? So. Yep. Very good. And it, Ferg, would you argue that any traumatic code, it would be reasonable to decompress the chest? I would, yes, I would say that, yes. Yeah. If you have an advanced airway, you're bagging somebody that got chest trauma, they go into cardiac arrest, I would argue that they have signs of a pneumothorax, right? And they have signs of tension and you decompress that chest. So when I get a call from an agency or a flight crew and they're like, hey, we're working this guy. And I'm like, is there an advanced airway? Yes. Is there chest trauma? Yes. Have you popped the chest? They say, no, I say decompress the chest and you may get somebody back. If you don't, no harm, no foul, right? So, so we did get one more question in, um, and this is an, an oldie and a goodie. Uh, so <laughs> thoughts and discussions on the bulky dressing for flail chest versus quote, internal splinting with advanced airway. I'll let you answer that one. Um, yeah, no, I say no bulky dressing. That doesn't do anything, right? That puts more pressure on the chest. They're not going to breathe. If somebody has a, a bad flail chest and they're having difficulty ventilating and oxygenating, they buy an ET tube. They get positive pressure ventilation. But if they got a flail chest and you have to use positive pressure ventilation to bag them or they intubate them, what else do they have to have? Chest tube or decompression, they're going to get attention to pneumothorax. So if you're in the field and you got somebody with a flail chest that's altered, Hard to ventilate, you get them tubed, can go ahead and state says that's a category eight. Well, go ahead and uh, decompress that chest too, because they're gonna have to, you're gonna get a intention in the thorax at that point. So yeah. yeah ultimately, ultimately they're gonna need an OR to fix the, the rib section, but positive pressure was is what's gonna fix it initially. Right. So that's remember, why you, that's why you intubate them. That's why you do, yeah. Right. So if you have a pneumothorax and you're using a positive pressure ventilation, they will get attention pneumothorax if you don't put a chest tube in them. Or flail chest. Or flail chest. Or if they have a pneumothorax and you intubate them and they have a pneumothorax from COPD and you put them in the ventilator, they're going to get attention to pneumothorax at some point because they have a pneumothorax and doing positive pressure. That's um, right. And, and some some tension pneumothorax can develop very rapidly, but sometimes it takes takes a while to develop. Is that correct? Yep. A couple things I wanted to add. Uh, massive chest trauma like that shotgun blast to the chest. If you do want to put an occlusive dressing, you don't have a big one, a defib pad works pretty good for those things. I like defib pads are good for that. If they get signs of attention, undo it, give it a few seconds, and put it back on. That's how you decompress those. Remember with chest decompression, if you go on laterally, um, most of the studies that talk about that were done, were done on military people that are healthy, right? Remember, we don't see those people. We see the person that's five foot four, 300 pounds. So, um, the nipple line is great, but it's the anatomical nipple line, if you get what I'm saying. So just oh, yeah. be careful. You don't want to put a needle in somebody's chest and it really be in their belly. Um, I've seen it. You don't want to be that guy. Uh, what else was I going to mention? And then for trauma, remember, everything is ABC, but in acute trauma, hemorrhage control kind of comes first as well. So if they have an extremity injury or something, tourniquets go on. Remember, chest decompression is an airway procedure. And then remember, um, uh, blood products. So for folks that are advanced practice, uh, blood is out there. For folks that are not advanced practice, what can we give to give somebody to help them not bleed as much in trauma? TXA. So TXA has limited risk, a lot of potentials. I would hope that in the future, more ground services move toward the critical care, maybe even in critical care intercept, and we have access to plasma or, or, uh, or blood products. So that's all I got to add. Thank you, Dr. Payne. Very good. Hey, great lectures today. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Thanks, Dr. Payne. Thanks for all the fine folks here at Oxford who came out uh, to participate live. We really appreciate it. Thanks to Chief Sparks for hosting. Thanks to Alabama Fire College for sponsoring uh, this program and making it possible.
Just one more reminder, please fill out an attendance form. Even if you don't need the CEUs, it helps give us your feedback and helps give, give us an accurate count. If you're listening online and for some reason you can't access the chat to get the link, then you can send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated response with a link to the attendance form. And the password for today's attendance form is cardio, C-A-R-D-I-O, cardio. And that's all we got. We're going to eat some lunch here at Oxford, and then we're going to move into Skills Lab. If you're in the area, come uh, come by and participate with us, and uh, we'll have a good time in the Skills Lab. Thanks, everybody.